Hi everyone, how are you doing today? In this video, I thought I would go over this book called Yes to Life, In Spite of Everything. Uh, really just going through some quotes that stood out to me. This is a newly published book that was written back in the 40s by Viktor Frankl. Uh, you may have heard of Viktor Frankl as the author of um, a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, really great book. I'm actually in the process of rereading it, um, inspired by this recent publication. But anyway, um, Frankl was a psychiatrist. He was a Holocaust survivor. He lost his whole family um, through the oppression and the concentration camps of the Nazis. And so his big focus as a psychiatrist, as someone who you know, studied the human mind was, well, two things. He had this, uh, this uh, logotherapy method, which um, I, I'm sort of reviewing that as I'm reading his other books, so maybe I'll have more to share about that later. Um, but basically focusing on the meaning of life, uh, especially for someone who has gone through such terrible experiences and whose life at you know, certain points in time, it, it just wasn't sure if he was going to make it out or not. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of a summary of who he was. I'll, I might talk about him more if I do a video on man's search for meaning. Um, but uh, Yes to Life is a book, really a collection of lectures that he gave after he was liberated. And it really uh, focuses specifically on... Uh, the meaning of life as viewed from different perspectives, different types of suffering. Uh, he talks about people that have suicide, suicidal thoughts, people that have terminal illnesses. So he goes into some of these really uh, difficult scenarios. Uh, this was a very short book, but I thought he, he really said a lot in it. And it was highly thought-provoking. I'm just looking at the page count here. Um, yeah, it's like about 100 pages. Very quick read, but um, very insightful. I'm not going to do a full book review. I just want to go over the quotes. Um, and, and these are quotes that I feel like are really applicable to what we're going through right now as a society. But at the same time, I don't necessarily want to make those direct connections. Uh, I, I also want this video to be somewhat universal that you could uh, watch it at a later date and maybe make other connections. So I'm just going to read the quotes, give some thoughts from a general point of view, and then uh, leave you the mental space to draw your own conclusions about how it relates to us right now. Early on in the book, he talks about action and activism. And he says, if there is a fundamental difference between the way people perceive the world around them in the past and the way they perceive it at present, then it is perhaps best identified as follows. In the past, activism was coupled with optimism, while today activism requires pessimism. Um, this, of course, coming after his experience in the concentration camps, and really everything after World War II and World War I, for that matter, just this kind of enormous cynicism about history that had led up to those two terrible and really unprecedented conflicts. Um, so that, that's kind of his context for this perspective. He also talks about uh, the importance of, you know, walking the walk. He says, that which is actualized is also much more effective. Words alone are not, not enough. Um, pretty, pretty self-explanatory. He talks about, you know, meaning of life. So he very much tries to lead you away from the conception that life is about the pursuit of happiness, right? And so he says, life is somehow duty, a single huge obligation. Happiness should not, must not, and can never be a goal, but only an outcome. On page 33, it is not we who are permitted to ask about the meaning of life. It is life that asks the questions, directs questions at us. We are the ones who are questioned. 
and on page 36, where whether a life is fulfilled doesn't depend on how great one's range of action is, but rather only on whether the circle is filled out. And here he's talking about, you know, as a person, your meaning is not necessarily something that can be stacked against other people's meaning and their experiences. So it's very much based around your circle of influence and impact, which could be very small. You know, we're not all international influencers, but whatever scope that you have, the people that you interact with, you know, your meaning or your fulfillment, it it really has to do with how well you fill that space in the world. Not so much how big the space is. I really like this whole concept and it really addresses succinctly the problems with trying to chase after the perfect life or things that make you happy because obviously you don't get what you want all the time and you know more often than not you're going to meet with certain disappointments so this this is a very uh, helpful perspective for people that are not really finding uh, the pursuit of happiness that is often promoted especially from a commercial aspect yeah so moving on you know he gives lots of examples from his experience as a psychiatrist i thought that was very interesting Um, he even alludes to the questions about okay well what if you don't have kids what if you know you can't or you know there there are some circles where they put a huge emphasis on you know getting married having a family and, and certainly family is an important unit in society. Um, but but as far as whether it is like a fulfillment of meaning, he would say here, um, either a life, an in- individual life has meaning, or this individual life, the life of an individual person does not have meaning. And then it could never acquire meaning merely by seeking to immortalize itself by procreation. Because immortalizing something that is inherently meaningless is itself meaningless. Um, let's see. So comparing your suffering with someone else's um, easy to do. I think uh, he says, in spite of everything, no human suffering can be compared to anyone else's because it is part of the nature of suffering that it is the suffering of a particular person. That is, it is his or her own suffering that its magnitude is dependent solely on the sufferer. A person's solitary suffering is just as unique and individual as every person. Oh, as is every person. Um, yeah, this one was really interesting because I was having a conversation with someone recently about this very topic and explaining how, you know, something they had shared about their experiences was helpful to me. And, you know, we got into this question about, well, why, why is that so? And is it so? Because for some people... It doesn't necessarily help them to hear about other people's suffering. Um, I, I do think that that looking at suffering from an individual angle as opposed to just suffering as its own entity, as its own thing, uh, this personalized aspect to it makes a lot of sense. And it's really quite powerful for somebody like Viktor Frankl to have said that who had gone through such um, enormously terrible experiences, um, for him to tell that to this person here in the book, he says he was talking to someone who had served as a soldier and the soldier was telling him, well, you know, like comparing his sufferings as a soldier and, and telling Frankel that his sufferings must, must have been so much greater than the soldiers. Um, but, but he kind of like waves that away here and says it, it really is particular to you. Um, yeah, I, I have mixed feelings about that, but that, that was very, a uh, very different angle on, on this topic than you'll hear often. Last one I have here is one on collective guilt. He says, oh, I need to put the page number in here. Um, he says, we have to differentiate between collective guilt and collective liability. If I suddenly get appendicitis... Is it my fault? Certainly not. And yet if I have to have an operation, what then? 
I will nevertheless owe the fee for the operation to the doctor who operated on me. That is, I am liable for the settlement of the doctor's bill. So liability without guilt definitely exists. This is a huge topic, and I think that I'm not sure how I how I have yet been able to process it fully. Um, some thoughts just, and I'm not really that well versed in you know, philosophy and such, but I'm, I'm trying to learn and some things that come to mind here are, well, definitely want to distinguish between problems that are moral problems versus things that are amoral or neutral. I think neutral is probably a better word here than amoral. Um, so yeah, appendicitis, there's not necessarily anything you do that gives you appendicitis. It just happens. Um, so yeah, what he says there makes sense. You do have to make wrongs right if it is something that, you know, is going to have long lasting impacts that unless righted are just going to continue to fester, right? Um, yeah, and then there's this whole relationship between justice and forgiveness, which we probably, I, I don't want to talk about that in this video, but just throwing it out there. Yeah, so, I don't know, just interesting stuff. There were a lot of quotes like this in the book that just jumped out at me. I recommend reading it, super short, good introduction to Frankel. Um, yeah, let me know if you've read any of his books, if you have any thoughts on this. I will, again, try to do a video on Man's Search for Meaning once I've finished rereading it. Uh, thanks for watching. Please like the video if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.